Hey y'all, how you doing? Um, wanted to apologize for not making a video yesterday, but it's not that I didn't make a video. I actually made one, but it didn't take. I spent about an hour in prayer, and then about an hour making a video, and it didn't save. So by the time I was done, I was out of time. Um, did y'all get to see that that woman get healed in the uh, um, in the Hertz Rent a Car place? That was really cool. Uh, I had one buddy, uh, one person ask me, uh, what did you say? What did you do? It's pretty much like I say in my videos of healing. Um, I went in, the way, the way it happened was I went in and as soon as I walked in, there were two people. There was a woman to the, to my left and a man to my right. And the man to my right asked me, can I help you? And for some reason, I knew I was supposed to talk to the woman on the left. So I just kind of stood there and, and I said, uh, I'm just waiting. And he, he turned around, went about his business. And as soon as she was done typing up on the computer what she was going to type up, um, she uh, looked at me and said, can I help you? And, and I went out, walked up to the counter and started giving her my information uh, uh, for, for the rental car. And uh, so I asked her, what I asked people, I said, um, tell me, what do you know about Jesus? And she stopped typing and she kind of pushed her chair back and she looked up at me and she said, tell me what you know about Jesus. Well, don't you know that was probably the wrong question and maybe it was the right question because I told her what I knew. And she had ears to hear. She wanted to know more. And she kept asking questions and she kept asking questions and every time she asked a question, I'd answer it. And uh, in walks this lady, she comes in behind me, and I turned around and looked at her, and it was Thelma. And I knew immediately I was supposed to pray for her, but this woman kept asking me questions, and we were talking, we were talking, we were talking. And then when I turned around to give my attention to Thelma, she was sitting down, she was on the phone, so I didn't want to interrupt her. And uh, I, I went out to get my car, and they had a minivan for me. I, I'm not, I don't want to drive around in a minivan. I don't want to, you know, I mean... It, the, the car I'm going to be driving in is not my car, but it, I want it to be a car, not a minivan. You hear me? So I, um, so I went back in and told him. I said, "Hey, you know, you got anything besides a minivan?" And they're like, "Hello, well, you know, let, let's give us a second. We'll look." So in the meantime, uh, I turned around and there Thelma was off the phone, and I and I went over and I sat down next to her and I said, "Hey." Have you got any pain in your body? And what's funny is her first response was no. And that happens a lot of times. People will tell you no. And I said, are you sure there's something that you need prayer for? And that's when she goes into, well, you know, my back is, yeah, yeah, my back, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, that's right. I, it's like, it's like she forgot about it. It's like, yeah, that's right. I got into a car uh, accident and my back is bad it's really really stiff I can't move I can't do anything so I got up and I went around the other side because I was sitting on her left side and uh, I like to take the right hand and hold the right hand so I took her right hand and my right hand and put my hand on her lower back and I prayed over her lower back actually I didn't pray over it I spoke to it I commanded the pain to go I took authority over it I commanded the muscles to relax I commanded the the soft tissue to be healed ligaments tendons muscles be healed I commanded the blood to flow in the area I commanded the swelling to go down I spoke there were two discs that I sensed were out of place that they would go into place and um, when I finished I kind of distract her a little bit I talked her a little bit and I asked her I said so you know how do you feel and she immediately went, well, you know, I got this, my neck, my neck, oh, you didn't tell me your neck was hurt. So um, as I was praying over her, the Lord showed me that she was driving in a car and she got into an accident. And she's a spirit-filled believer. And spirit-filled believers cannot be indwelled by a demonic spirit, but a demonic spirit can attach themselves on top of them, onto them. They can't enter them because they have the Holy Spirit in them. What they do is they latch on the top of them and they, they dig their talons in. And what he showed me was 
that she is so in tune in the spirit that that thing could have never just come on her. She would have sensed it. But when the accident happened, because it was so traumatic, that was his opportunity to jump on her and latch his talons in her. So the, the accident happened in January, and here it is almost May, four months later, and she's still in agony. It's still not getting any better. Well, don't you know, if you, if you hurt yourself and you, like, let's say you strain a muscle or tear a ligament, even, even a torn ligament, which is a serious injury, heals after about uh, 8, 10, 12 weeks. Well, that injury should go away. So if you're suffering from, from a car accident injury a year, you know, uh, three months, four months, five months, six months, or a year later, this is demonic. This is a spiritual thing, unless, unless you've got a, a torn ligament that's never been repaired, or unless you've got fractures and bones that have never been repaired, it's probably a, a demonic spirit. So that thing took the opportunity to latch onto her because of the trauma. She didn't sense it. She didn't know it. So when I took authority over that thing and I commanded the spirit to go, you heard what she said. She said she felt it go away. And then she started moving freely. She got up. She was touching her toes and she was doing all that. So that's kind of how that happened. And then what's funny was um, she, uh, I, I videoed it and I put it on you know, I put it on the YouTube, and then I um, I texted her and told her. I said, "Hey, you're up on YouTube, and you're getting about a view a minute." And she she a couple minutes later she texts me back. She goes, "You got to take it down. You got to take it down." My lawyer told me you got to take it down. Apparently, she's in a lawsuit over the car accident. Now, see, this is where the kingdom of God comes in. Remember, I told you when I was going through that thing with my wife. I had lawyers and, 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 and uh, accountants hiding my money on one hand, and on the other hand, I was trying to uh, save my marriage standing on the word and believing in faith, but they're diametrically opposed to each other. So I'm trying to use God's system, the kingdom of God on one hand, and the world system of using accountants and lawyers on the other hand, and I had to make a decision and fire one to use the other. So... Um, I'm actually praying for her right now that she would get revelation on this, that the Holy Spirit would talk to her about what to do. Because if she's going to put her trust in the court system and and not in in, in God, and I don't know how it all works. You know, I, I just know that if she's not in pain anymore, that changes the the dynamics of her case. And she needs to put her trust in the kingdom of God, not in, in the court system. So um, if anybody gets a minute, pray for Thelma to, that the Holy Spirit would reveal that to her. Because I don't have a relationship with her, or I can just call her up and minister to her. Um, so, anyways, uh, I'm getting back on the uh, the message of uh, authority, and um, you know, um, on this earth, we are supposed to act like God. We are here in God's stead. It's like if we had a, a child and we put him over our business, we would expect our employees to respect that child and to obey that child. And, we, and we've given that son the, the job of management over that factory or that thing that we're doing. And that's the same way with us. You know, unlike Adam who passed over his God-given authority to the alien Satan, you know, uh, Jesus uh, showed up and, and went to hell on the third day and he took it back for us. Now, you know, I, I was thinking about this and God could have done it like this. He could have said, you know, you guys messed up. You know, you, you gave the authority to Satan. I have come and I have taken it back for you. And, uh, you know, you guys just, just sit down and be quiet and I'll take care of this from here. You guys don't, you can't use this authority properly. You, you don't know what you're doing. You know, you, you're just, you're going to mess it up. But he didn't. He gave it back to us. You know, here it is. We messed it up. He came and took it back, and then he gives it back to us. And you know, and, and, and the sad thing about that is, even after he gives it back to us, how many people actually really walk in it? You know? But he's saying, I give you this authority. Be like Jesus. Be like Jesus on earth. Be like a chip off the old block. Now, don't you know, when this happened, it had to kind of mess Satan up. Because here, for, what, nearly 2,000 years, he'd been running around doing whatever, actually 4,000 years. He'd been running around doing whatever he wanted. He was the God of this world. You know, when he took Jesus up on the mountain, he said, he said, look at everything. I own it all. Fall down and worship me, I'll give it to you. Jesus didn't argue with him and say, no, you don't. My father owns all this. Because he understood Satan had the legal right. He had the deed to the earth. Adam gave it to him. So he didn't argue with him about it. 
he just rebuked him and quoted the scripture because he knew the cross was coming. He knew he was going to get it back. But see, Satan now has lost authority and he has to deal with this new position he has because he's no longer in authority. He's under us. And don't you know that had to really, really piss him off? I mean, come on, y'all. Sorry about the vulgarity there. I, well, that's not really vulgar, but it's just crude. It really had to upset him because we're mortal. He's a spiritual being. He's this great, giant, I mean, powerful, demonic, you know, angelic, demonic, whatever he is, spirit. And now he's subject to us again. Oh, man. And he had some new things to figure out. First thing I think that he had to figure out was how to hide this new decree from us so that we didn't know it. And don't you know, he's a master at that. He put on his best poker face and he did it. Because for thousands of years, believers really don't know, didn't know, and don't know who they are. I think that hiding authority from believers next to deceiving people into, into believing that he doesn't even exist, hiding authority was probably his greatest deception in the church era. But you know what? It's time for us to let the cat out of the bag. I mean, I, I want y'all to start talking about authority to everybody. Let them know who they are and whose they are. Let that cat out of the bag. So that Satan's going to have to come up with another plan. Because this one doesn't work anymore. You know? Now, he's no beginner. I always say, he t it, took, it took Jesus to defeat him. But, if we know who we are, if we meditate on the law day and night, if we put the word in, we will be victorious. One thing that Satan does do that he's really good at, you know, there's, um, When he took Jesus in the desert, he tempted him three times. And three times Jesus rebuked him with the word. He said, it is written. And then the Bible says, and, and Satan left him for a season. So what will happen is when you guys get out there and you start really commanding and demanding and take authority, you're going to mess the devil up. Because everybody around you is going to see it and things are going to change. You know, I got people writing, writing comments into me about taking authority over stuff and stuff changing like that. You know, Marlene, Marlene's got some great comments. Y'all need to read Marlene's comments. I mean, she's got some, she's taking authority. She's making a difference everywhere she goes in her, in her you know, with her neighbors and, and at work. I mean, she's just taking authority over stuff and miracles are happening. And see, that's the power of authority is miracles will follow them. Miracles follow authority, all right? And and it'll give the devil a black eye. It'll make him look bad. It makes him look bad in his community, amongst his demons. And he ain't no fool. He will leave for a little while. He will leave for a season. And, and I got to tell you, this is actually a dangerous time because when he leaves for a season, you're not exercising that authority muscle, that faith muscle anymore. And it will atrophy. And he'll wait a little while till we become complacent. He'll sneak around six months a year later and he'll come back in. And we've forgotten how to do what we've done or we've gotten lazy about it because we haven't had to do it. And he'll, he'll, he'll try again. And a lot of times he'll go back to his old tricks, stuff that got us in the past. So you got to keep your eyes open and, and keep exercising that faith muscle. Look for people to pray with. You know, if you're not being attacked, go out and find people to pray with. You know, uh, Mark 4, the sower sows the word, says, These are the ones sown on the wayside when Satan comes immediately to take away the word that was sown in their heart. See, Satan comes when? immediately. And what is he coming after? The word that was sown in their heart. See, he don't want that word going in. 
He doesn't want you to get to understand your place, your power, your authority. He's always after that word. You know, when God raised Jesus from the dead, I believe it was his, his greatest act. I mean, that was just like the coolest thing in the whole world. And, 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 and Ephesians says when he raised Jesus from the dead, well, you, you know, you can't lift up the head without lifting up the body. We're the body of Christ. You know, we, 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 we talked about this before, that, that we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. You know, uh, it's, it's Ephesians 1, 17, I believe, and it goes through into the second verse. And I like the way it says it in the Amplified. It says, he did this so that he might clearly demonstrate through the ages to come the immeasurable, limitless, and surpassing riches of his free grace, his unmerited, undeserved favor in his kindness and goodness of heart towards us in Christ Jesus. So God is saying, I will work through you, but before I can work through you, I have to raise you up. Before I can work uh, through you, uh, I, I have to make you alive. Uh, before I can work through you, I have to seat you in heavenly places with the anointed one and his anointing. So I want you to get an understanding that you are seated in heavenly places in the anointing of Christ Jesus. We're at the right hand of all power on high. And this is not a fantasy. This is not some pie in the sky notion. And this is what the word says about us. Paul is always trying to get them to understand who they were, the position they held, who their father was, who their Lord and Savior is, and what their relationship is to him so that they didn't walk around with arrogance, but with confidence. See, it's confidence. You know, a lot of times people tell me, oh man, you must have great faith to do what you're doing. And I told, tell you before, God showed me very clearly, it's not about faith. You know, we talked about the other day, Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, which is about the size of the head of a pin, it's smaller, it's smaller than a sesame seed, y'all. Oh my gosh. And, and, the, and the, the, the meaning behind that is, and again, it's, it's that big. And the meaning, what Jesus is trying to imply is, it doesn't require hardly any faith. I mean, nothing is smaller than a mustard seed. If you got less faith than a mustard seed, you got nothing. Because less than a mustard seed is nothing. It's absolutely nothing. So even the most minuscule amount of faith is enough to move mountains. That's what Jesus is saying. It's not about faith. It's confidence in who I am. I am confident in, I'm confident in who I am, I'm confident in who Jesus is, and I'm confident in who my Father is, and I'm confident in what my Father says about me and who I am. That's a difference. It's not faith. It's confidence. It's identity. I know who I am. And what I'm trying to get across to y'all is, learn who you are. Just learn who you are. Walk around in boldness. Walk around in confidence. You know, I have... Um, in my business, uh, I used to teach in this town, this tech, West Texas, not West Texas, but it's out just outside of Houston. But it's like a small farm town. It was, it's called Katy, Texas. And it's grown now. It's quite a metropolis now. But at the time, it was just a little farm town, FFA. And, you know, I'm a future farmers of America. And it's really cool, kind of a, a neat place. It's a wholesome place, godly place, a lot of churches, Bible Belt, man, Christians everywhere. Great place. Not everywhere, but, you know, there's a good majority of believers there. And um, one thing, I, 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 when I started my Kid Fit Camp and I started doing Bible study there, most of my customers were secular. They were just regular Joes, raising family, but they liked the idea of a Christian place to put their kids, and they loved the martial arts end of it and the sports end of it better than a daycare when you got a seven, eight, nine, ten year old boy. You're not going to put him in a daycare. So they put him in our place, and we're preaching the word to him. Now, these kids are getting saved. They're getting filled with the Holy Spirit. They're praying over people. People are getting, getting healed. You know, they're laying hands on people. They're casting out things. I mean, it's, it was remarkable. And the, I spent a lot of time trying to teach those kids who they were because they never had an understanding of their identity. And even after five years of telling them, your children are the most high God, there is still a doubt there. I, I never could put my finger on it, but I want to, I want to explain that to contrast it to where I am now. I am now 
in a completely different location in Houston. I'm in a town that's called Bel Air and there are many Jewish people there. I have a lot of Jewish customers. Lots of them. Now, they're not like Hasidic Jews. They don't follow all 613 uh, of the commandments of, of, of the Le Levitical law, but they consider themselves Jews. They, they follow all the feasts. They, you know, they, work, they go to temple and worship, you know, uh, uh, God the Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, in their minds, they're right with God, even though they don't follow the law like they're supposed to, in their mind, they're right with God. Here's the difference between their kids and, and, and the Christian kids. The Jewish kids walk around with an understanding that they're children of the Most High God, they're heirs to the throne, they are the chosen ones, they're the apple of God's eye, they understand that they're going to be leaders, not followers, they're going to be the, the company and corporate owners of the world and not, not, not the, 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 the guy that's, that's working on the assembly line. They have this mentality. They're raised with it. They understand that they're special. They're the apple of God's eye. And you know what's weird is when I go all the way back through my life, you know, I, I wasn't raised in a place where there were a lot of Jews or anything, but I've run into Jewish people throughout my life, especially when I was doing my business. I had many Jewish people come through my business, even though I was a Christian business. They, you know, I mean, they liked the martial arts end and, and they always liked to do it. And I never in my entire life can ever remember meeting one Jewish person who was ever broke, who was ever down on his luck, who was ever manically depressed, who was ever strung out on drugs or, or addicted to drugs in any way, shape, or form, who was ever anything but blessed and prosperous and happy. And I'm None. Now, how is that possible that I have no recollection of not even one? Not one. Now, there may be one out there. I'm not saying it never happens. I just never met one. And I'm in a business where I meet a lot of people because they have this mentality, this understanding, this confidence of who they are. They, ne they don't walk around negative, defeated, broke, busted, disgusted. They walk around in a confidence and they speak it. It comes out of their mouth. You hear it in, in their speech and their, when, when, when you just converse with them. If I talk to the parents and stuff, they just assume that they're blessed. They just assume it. I mean, they expect no less. They're children of the Most High God. And, and we have, Paul says, we have a better covenant than they do. How much more should we be blessed than they? It's our identity, y'all. It's our identity. Once we come to terms with who we are, that we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, that we are heirs to the throne, and not that we walk around arrogantly, because none of them that I've met are arrogant. They're just confident. Then there's a huge difference between arrogance and confidence. There's I've never met a rude one. Not one time have I ever met one that I didn't like, that wasn't sweet or friendly or, or humble. I mean, they're generous and, well, they're not generous. They're not generous. <laughs> they're actually very tight with their money, but they're very successful, you know? All right, so, So we're going to uh, Genesis 2, verse 7. And um, it says, Then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, has anyone ever heard of the Targum? The Targum is the text that the Jewish rabbis would have taught the people out of in the days of Jesus. It was uh, converted from Hebrew to Greek, the very first text. It is the most authentic, the most, the most authentic text that there is. It even predates the Septuagint, and it's it's thou, you know a thousand years or two, almost two thousand fifteen hundred years before the King James Bible. The Targum is the most authentic text that there is. I want you to listen to how it reads in the Targum. All right. It, this is in it, it this is actually not even uh, Greek it's Aramaic it's the ancient most ancient Aramaic text that there is and it goes like this 
Then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became another speaking spirit. So for those of you that have been not really receiving what I'm talking about when I told you that the Lord told me the power that the devil has, the power we give him by the words that we speak because the power of the spoken word was put, God said, the power, the same power that I use to create the earth, I put inside a man, but man does not know how to use it. He said, be a man of few words. All right, that's what he's saying here. The same power that God used to create the earth, the power of the spoken word, Man was created another speaking spirit. You know, if if my wife and I have a child, my wife and I have children, and my daughter looks just like my wife, which, praise God and thank you, Jesus, my wife is absolutely gorgeous. And my daughter is absolutely gorgeous. And, and you know, you got to understand that, you know, a man carries 23 chromosomes, a woman carries 23 chromosomes, to get to, together it's 46 chromosomes, and those chromosomes make up the DNA of that child. And the child adopts the characteristics of the mother or the father or a little of both. It's the exact same thing. When God created us, he took that ability and he put it into us. We have this characteristic of our father, you know, and the problem is that we, we don't know how to use it. But our enemy does. Our enemy does. Your mouth is connected to your heart. Let me say that again. Your mouth is connected to your heart. So why did God make us a speaking spirit? Why would he do that? Because we're created in his image. He is the God, the great God Jehovah, the speaking spirit. And he does everything with the words of his mouth. Remember we talked about that the other day. First he says it, then he sees it. He never sees anything until he says it first. God said, let there be light, and then there was light. Whenever God says something, that's the creative power. He created us to reign on the earth with power and authority of the spoken word. And he put the very nature to rule and to reign inside of us. It's in our mouth. And it comes out of our heart. That's why our mouth and our heart are connected. whether it be good or bad, they will bring forth a treasure. Whatever you speak with your mouth and believe in your heart. See, they're connected. They're connected. The two are connected. The Bible says your heart is like your treasure. If you put garbage in your treasure, garbage is going to come out of your mouth. If you put the word in, you treat your treasure like it's a, you treat your heart like it is a treasure, and you treasure it, and you let only good stuff comes in. You know your eyes and your ears are the gateway to your heart, so everything you see and everything you hear goes into your heart. So it's important to to watch and monitor what you hear and see, so that everything that's going in your heart is good, so that what's coming out of your mouth is good, because what's coming out of your mouth is has power, is the ability to create life or to kill. So before we go on, and I'm probably going to end right here, I want you to all understand something. I am not saying we're God. Now, Jesus said we are God's little g. We're not God. We're just a chip off the old block. We're children of our parents. So we have the DNA. We have the attributes. We have the abilities. We have the, the, the gifts and the talents that he's given us. He's put inside of us because we're his children. To be like him. 
We're supposed to be like our daddy. The Bible says be imitators of God. Normally, men, people, human beings only identify with the, the flesh side of who God is, who God was when he walked on the earth. But remember, God's a spirit. You know, we have to come get in tune and understand that we're a spirit like our Father. He created us in His image, a three-part being. You know, we're a spirit that has a soul that lives in flesh. We're a spirit that has a soul, mind, body, and, and emotions that lives inside of this flesh. I'm going to finish right there. But I've got a little story. Um, I I usually park at the gym and uh, I'll pray for about um, usually anywhere from 40 minutes to an hour. And then I'll read for a little while. And then um, maybe if I find something, I'll meditate on it for a little while. Every now and then I'll fan through my Bible and see if God wants to tell me something. And he always does. It's always really cool. And, um, and then I'll, I'll do my videos. You know, they've been running like 40 minutes. So I'm spending like two to three hours in the Word every day. Two to three hours. And, and that's not all. It's not like when I'm done, I just forget about God. I mean, He's on my mind all day long. When I'm on my way to work, I'm meditating on the Word, or I'm, let's, a lot of times I'm praying in the Spirit. Um, when I come home at night, a lot of times I'll sit down in my recliner, and I'll, I'll get in my Word, I'll pray for a little while, and when I go to bed, I, I usually pray myself until I fall asleep. I'm praying, I'm just praying in my mind until I fall asleep. And I have to tell you, I have to tell you, I want to... I don't want to alarm anybody, but I have to tell you, I feel like I'm not doing enough. And, and, and I'm not trying to put condemnation on anybody because this, everybody's different. I'm just feeling a sense of urgency in my spirit, like spend more time, more, draw in closer, draw in closer, draw in closer. There's an urgency behind my days Every day that goes by, I sense it more and more and more and more and more. Um, I had, uh, remember the story I told you about when my wife and I were, um, where my wife wanted to divorce me and I had an accountant and a lawyer and uh, I, God kind of convicted me that I need to stand on the kingdom of God and, and, and stand in faith and believe, so I had to fire those guys. Well, there was a guy I called. He was a pastor. And I called him and I ran it down to him. I said, this is my conflict. On one hand, I'm standing in faith. On the other hand, I got doctors and lawyers. And, you know, it's surprising that I even picked it up. It had to be the Holy Spirit because I was so immature at the time. I was a brand new believer. I, what did I know about conflict of that, that they didn't, the two kingdoms didn't jive? But I did, and he's the one who told me, Frank, you have to make a choice. You have to make a choice. You're going to choose faith, or you're going to choose the world. But you got to make a choice. You can't commingle the two systems. And that's when I made that choice. Well, that man, this story is about that man. He, um, he met this woman in college and got married. And, and the timing of all this could be wrong. It might not have been while they were in college. It might have been right after college. But I know they were both very young. He's older than me, so... Um, you know, he's, he's well on in age. So this was had to be 40, 45 years ago, right? Maybe more. And, um, no, not that long, probably 40 years ago. So, uh, him and his wife are really young. They get married and right after they get married, they both get saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. They're on fire for God. They're going to church every day. Now her father and mother are atheists. And when they tell them, because, you know, they, she loves her mother and she wants, mother and father, she wants to lead them to salvation. Their mother and father just um, rebuked them to the point where they're like, we don't want anything to do with you. You guys are religious zealot nuts. Don't even talk to us anymore. We, you know, you're excommunicated from the family. As far as we're concerned, you don't live. You don't exist. And he didn't go into a lot of detail, but it was like they just closed him off. They didn't really want any more relationship to do with him. That was it. And, you know, I don't know if she still stayed in touch with her mom and talked a little bit, but I do know that it was very adversarial, 
right? It wasn't a friendly relationship at all. They didn't like, the parents didn't like them anymore, didn't want them around, you know. So every night they would pray for them. My, my friends, uh, uh, John and Vicky, their names, I won't do any last names, but their names are John and Vicky. They would pray for them every night. They made it a point to do this every night. They would, she would sit on the couch and he would walk around the living room floor and they would pray about it and then he would take authority. Then he would take authority. And he did this thing, he said, where he would put his hand out and he would take his fist and he would say, Satan, in the name of the Lord Jesus, you cannot have them. In the name of Jesus, I command you, get your hands off of them. I bind you. And, he, and that was his thing. He would pound his, his fist into his palm and walk around the floor. And they did this every night, y'all. And 25 years later, right, he's, I want to say he's like 50. Her parents are in their 70s. And they get a phone call. Her father has had a heart attack. So they go running to the hospital, and um, he's there at the bedside, and he's alive. You know, they've resuscitated him. They brought him back, but he's not doing well. And my friend John is on the bedside. And at one point, he wakes up. Vicky's father wakes up. And when he looks at John, because John, John's an attorney, he grabs him by the shirt and he pulls him down. He says, tell me about Jesus. Tell me about Jesus. Tell me about Jesus. And John is like, whoa, 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 whoa. He's like, tell me about Jesus. I went to hell. Tell me about Jesus. I went to hell. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. And John's like, oh, okay, okay, okay. I've got a Bible in my car. I'll go get my Bible. And he went to turn walk away and the guy grabbed me and goes, no, don't go anywhere. You don't go anywhere until you tell me about Jesus. I want to get saved. I want to get saved right now. Honey, you got to get saved. You got to get saved. Hell is real. Jesus is real. You got to get saved. You got to get saved. And John's like, okay, okay, okay. And he walks him through the whole thing right then. And this is the story he told him after he got him, after he led him to salvation. After he, his heart stopped, he went to hell. And when he was in hell, he said, a bright light shone and there came Jesus, but he stopped. And just then, a dim light started to shine on the side over here and forth came Satan. And when he came forward, he said, the most evil, the most horrible, the most foul, the most disgusting, the most fear he've ever, he's ever experienced in his entire life flooded over him. And he turned to look at Jesus where he felt love and comfort from. And Jesus started to pull away and go away and go away. And that, de that, that Satan, the demonic spirit or whatever it was, it started coming to him like it was going to take him and take him and go. And then all of a sudden a light shined in front of him where John was walking around, smashing his hand on the fist saying, in the name of Jesus, Satan, you can't have him. You cannot have him. In the name of Jesus, I command you, get your hands off him. In the name of Jesus. And just then that demonic spirit had to flee and, and Jesus came forth and put his arms around him and hugged him and loved him. And then, boom, he was back in his body. And that's the power of prayer, y'all. That's the power of prayer and the power of authority. So I want to give you that encouragement. Don't give up on those people. Don't give up on those people in your life that are rebuking you and, and, and condemning you and calling you names. And they, 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 they won't claim it. They won't do it. And they, they're mocking you. These people mocked him. They, they disowned their own daughter. Are you hearing me? They disowned their own daughter and they never gave up on him. They loved those people and they, they, her they, they prayed for him every night, and it saved his life, and it saved his eternal life. So I wanted to tell you that story. I want to say I love you all. Sorry about missing yesterday. I didn't really miss. I actually did do the, do the video. It just didn't come out. So, But hey, what I did was I figured out how to transfer all my files off my phone onto my SD disk because all my phone, the space was gone, and it just wouldn't save the files anymore. And hopefully, I'm not going to sound like a Japanese Godzilla movie, and my lips are going in sync with my with my voice. 
with my video or whatever it is, the voice and the video are going in sync because I know a couple of them are way off and it just drives me nuts when I see it. I can't even stand it. So if that's the case, flip the phone over. You don't have to look at my ugly mug. Just, uh, just receive the message. Y'all take care. I will be back tomorrow. We're going to finish up Authority. There's so much more. We are another speaking spirit, y'all. We're another speaking spirit. We're a chip off the old block. We're just like our daddy. I'll talk to you later. Bye.